Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's go to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John in chapter 3. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your precious spirit we feel in this place today. Have your way, Jesus. Help us to have the mind of the Spirit to follow you. The book of 1 John in chapter 3, right before Revelations, if that'll help you. Amen. We'll go to the seventh verse. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. These are the words that John spoke to us. He said, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I want to go back to verse 7 and I'm going to take my thought from the first portion of verse 7. Where John wrote, little children, let no man deceive you. You may be seated. For a few moments this morning, I'd like to preach to you on this thought. Who are you following? Who are you following? If I was to mention to you the name or the word Facebook, well, everybody in here for the most part is familiar with the term Facebook. Right? I won't get into all my names of all the other social media platforms because I don't know them all, but I know there's a bunch of them. But nevertheless, Facebook is probably one of the most prominent social, prominent social platforms out there today. And Facebook is big on followers, isn't it? Does any of you know how many people you got following you? And it'll tell you. Does, does anybody know right now what's trending on Facebook? I don't know either. I myself am a Facebook stalker. What does that mean? It means I don't post much, but I look at it. I look at what everybody else posts, and that keeps me from posting. Because there's a lot of dumb people out there. i just being honest. I'm plain, okay? Don't mean to be offensive, but I'm just plain. And so I understand today that a lot of folks just love to put their business out on Facebook. They love to tell it when they get mad. They love to vent. Well, I mean, if you're mad at somebody, wouldn't it be a whole lot better to tell them? And not tell the whole world, you know? I mean, because once that stuff goes out there, you can't take it back. I mean, you can take it down, but I guarantee you somebody's archived it. Somebody's pulled it down for future reference. And they're happy, melancholy, whatever you want to say, you'll find every range of emotion that is known to man, you'll find it on Facebook. There's some good things on Facebook, and there's trash on Facebook. You know, and, and there's probably more trash than there is good things. So you have to be very careful how you navigate Facebook. You can get in trouble in a hurry. Uh-huh. And you got to know how to get off that thing real fast. Like, shoo, you know. Because it'll put something on you quick, fast, in a hurry if you ain't careful. But everybody likes somebody to read their story. You know, it has reels, you know. What's your story? You got something. It'll, it'll ask me if I got a story, if I want to post a story, if I, I want to do this, that, other. No, I don't want to do nothing. You know, 
my pictures on there is a picture from a long time ago, you know, and I just, I, I just ain't done nothing. I mean, what you see is what you see. I post my daily thing on the church's uh, Facebook page, my daily devotional on the church Facebook page, but that's about all uh, the uh, posting I do. Because if I give you a message, I want to have a message about Christ. I want to give you a message about hope. I find that the biggest followers are the ones that are stirring up controversy. Or the ones that are getting the most follows and likes are the ones that are stirring something up. The ones that are doing something. Well, I figure I just want to stir something up today. How about that? But I want to stir something up good. I want to tell you today that there's somebody out there that's trying to trick you. There's somebody out there trying to fool you today. And John wrote to us and he said, Little children, let no man deceive you. And that word deceive there from the Greek translation just simply means that somebody is trying to cause you to stray. That somebody is trying to lead you from the right path. We find today that there are a lot of ideas about how people should live today. And there's a lot of resentment that goes along with anybody that tells anybody how they should do something, right? Would you agree this morning that we live in a culture, amen, where the predominant feeling is that I don't want nobody to tell me how to do nothing? There is a great sentiment out there of resentment in our society today of people that are easily offended by anyone that tries to give them any help or any good advice whatsoever i'll be the first one to tell you that i don't know much i'm not the brightest bulb on the porch but i ain't the dimmest one either right amen but there are a lot of folks that they got commentary about everything. You could ask them, they wouldn't even be able to read their name in boxcar letters, but they'd have something to tell you about nuclear physics. You know? They know a little bit of something about everything. You could tell them something, and the first thing they do is they'll take it from you and start telling you about it, and they ain't even been there. Are we in that culture today? Amen. Everybody seems to know something about everything. Well, I'm just going to make an honest admission to you today. I don't want to know everything about everything. There's some things I prefer not to know. Sometimes ignorance is bliss, you know. And I'm just that fella. If I know it, I'll tell you I know it. If I don't know it, I'll tell you I don't know it. I don't have, amen, to have that ego check that says don't let nobody be smarter than you are i'd rather somebody think i'm dumb and prove them wrong than to think that to tell them i'm smart and they figured that i was a dummy anyway right and so the bible says that john is telling us that we need to be careful who we follow the bible's telling us that we need to be careful of who we pay attention to or who we take counsel from. Now, we find that there are a lot of folks that are in the counseling business. Every once in a while when I go up and I'm taking grain to the uh, grain market there and, and, and dumping a truckload, whether it's wheat or corn or soybeans, I'll walk in there and they got Dr. Phil on. How many of you are familiar with Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil was made famous by none other than Oprah, right? He got his, how many of you like Oprah? I'm glad nobody raised your hand. I won't have to preach on you. But nevertheless, he got his notoriety from Oprah. And now Dr. Phil has, has made his money, amen, through television and through getting selected cases and going through people's lives and all of this stuff and trying to help them. You know it's all staged. You know it's all just put together. It's a TV drama just to hook people and all of these things. But there's a lot of folks that buy into this stuff. 
A lot of folks that give it credence. A lot of folks that take this advice. Amen. And we really don't know. Amen. When we listen to these folks because their own lives are a wreck most times. Right? Their own lives have fallen apart. Their own lives are shattered. And they're sitting there telling me, Amen, what I need to do to keep, Amen, from falling apart. What we need today, church, is the spirit of discernment. What we need today is the ability given by the Spirit of God to be able to rightly divide that which is honest and true from that which is false and profane. We understand today, if you would go to the book of Judges in chapter 17, we find today that after Joshua died, and you remember who Joshua was. He was the one who took the mantle after Moses and led the children into the land of Canaan, and they occupied Canaan under Joshua's leadership. We find that Joshua has passed away and gone on to his reward, and now the children are left there with no judge. The children of Israel are left there with nobody to lead them, and Judges 17 and 6 tells us that in those days there was no king in Israel. And I want to add a little something here. There was a king in Israel, but Israel rejected that king. You know who that king was? That king was God. That king was Jehovah Jireh that had brought them out of bondage, out of Egypt, into a land flowing with milk and honey. But that's not what they wanted. They wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted a mortal to sit on the throne when they had an immortal sitting on the throne that loved them and claimed them as their own. And so they refuted God as their king. And so it says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You would call that in that time. We could give that a term, and, and we like terms and labels, just like we don't like to be grass mowers anymore. We're lawn care technicians, right? Or we're not janitors. We are some kind of cleaning expert, you know? Custodian. That ain't even good today. They got to have a bigger title. You know, they got to be some kind of technician or something. Just adds prestige to a dirty job, right? But we would call it what they were living in in that day, radical individualism. Now I want you to think about that term. Because a lot of times we hear today, folks have got this narrative that things are different now than they were back then. But what I want to take you back to is what the Bible teaches us, that there's nothing new under the sun. What does that mean to you and I? It doesn't mean that they had airplanes back then. No, no, no. That's not what we're not putting a, a terminology of modern day things. What there means is that there's no new sin. There's no new nature under the sun. That nature is no different today than it was back in the days of Moses. That it was in the days of Joshua. And so we understand when Joshua dies and there's no leadership we understand when people are left to their own ideas, things get crazy. And therefore, we can come up with the term radical. And what does radical mean? Radical just simply means that things are extreme. That things are going. They're bouncing off the one, uh, one way or the other. There's no, there's no level place. There's no medium place. There's no where to rightly divide something. We're either totally left or we're totally right. Isn't that where society is today? And what we're understanding in the days of uh, uh, after the death of Joshua, things were crazy. Folks were trying to figure it out. And so they came up with this their own ideal of what morality was. They came up with their own idea of what spirituality was. They come up with their own idea of how they ought to live their life. And so when they came up with their own idea, they said, Well, I thought of it. It works for me. It must be right. Hence, we get this idea and we get this little terminology. If it feels good, do it. If it seems right, it must be right. Huh? They were doing what they wanted to do without governance, 
without seeking governance. And there was no restriction in their life. There was no boundaries in their life. Can I tell you today that boundaries are important to all of us? That every one of us today need boundaries in our life. We need things to keep us in check. We need things to keep us in moderation. I want you to understand today that the Spirit of God, amen, that the power, the blood of Jesus Christ is a moderator in our life. It is a boundary in our life today. Amen. It keeps us from what we think is right. Amen. And it leads us to what is right. Because Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only truth today. There is no other path. There is no other way other than the way of Christ today to lead us to life eternal. And even then, there's a lot of ideas about how we're going to get to heaven. I remember years ago, uh, President Bush the second one, amen, he made a statement that all roads lead to heaven. He was off in that statement just a little bit. Amen, I'll tell you this, that all roads lead to judgment but only one road leads to heaven. And that's a path made through Calvary by Jesus Christ the Lord. There is no other way to gain entrance into the city of God except through Jesus Christ the Lord. And John is telling us, let no man deceive you. Amen. And trick you and tell you that you can get there by any other means except through Jesus. We have examples in the Bible, amen, where folks did that which was right in their own eyes. And the cost had great consequences. We find that Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit because they thought it was right in their eyes. But God said it was wrong. We find that uh, the sons of Jacob sold Joseph into slavery because they thought it was the right thing to do instead of killing him. But it was wrong. We find that Nadab and Abihu, they offered strange fire before the Lord because it seemed right for them to do. But what did God do? God slew them in a moment in His wrath because it was wrong in His eyes. We find that David committed adultery as king because it was right in his eyes because he was a king, but yet it was wrong in the eyes of God. I want you to know today... Hey man, that when we begin to reason as mere mortals, as we begin to reason as mere humans today, and we begin to tolerate and we begin to embrace the things of sin, we begin to embrace the things, amen, that the flesh desires. Hey man, it feels good to us, but it's wrong in the eyes of God. Worldliness is wrong in the eyes of God. Sin is wrong in the eyes of God. And God will not tolerate sin. God, amen. Amen. Not, will not wink at sin. God will not, amen, turn his eye away from sin. But God will judge the recklessness of men. I find today that in this Christian terminology, in this Christian age, we got folks that like to refer to our life in Christ as reckless. That they like to refer as faith in God as reckless. I want you to know that there's nothing reckless about the faith. There's nothing reckless about the way of God. Reckless is carefree. Reckless is without caution. Reckless is without direction. I want you to understand that everything Jesus did was foreordained of God. I want you to know that every step that Jesus took on this earth was foreordained of God. Why? Because your life and my life depended on it. Because my salvation and your salvation depended on it. It depended, amen, directly on Jesus Christ, not to vary from the plan of the cross that we could have life. If Jesus had varied from the plan of God, then Calvary would have been a bust. But we find today that we are hearing many ideals and many ideas about the ways that we ought to serve God. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs in chapter 16 and verse 25, the Bible says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, 
a man, but the end thereof is what? Death. What kind of death are you talking about? Are you talking about a physical death? You can sin all day long, friend. You can do anything you want to do under the cover of hypocrisy. You can pretend all day long you're a child of God and live like the devil. And get away with it for a time. You can get away with it for a season. But there'll come a reckoning day. Do you recall what John said? I read it to you. In verse 8, and the Bible said it this way. He said, He that committeth sin is of the devil. He didn't say you were a devil. He said you were of the devil. Now what does that mean? That just simply means to you and I, amen, that, that we are acting in a way, amen, that is mirroring the devil. That we are mimicking what the devil does. That we are acting or going in the council or in the actions of what the devil were doing or part of the devil's work. That's the Greek interpretation. And so nobody likes to be called the devil, do they? Well, I love them shirts that people put, you can't judge me or don't judge me. I love them shirts because it's a sheer statement of ignorance. Because it's a gross misinterpretation of the Bible. It's somebody saying in their arrogance, I'm going to do what I want to do. And you can't stop me. And God can't stop me. And nobody's going to get in my way. And God's going to like it. And if He don't like it, it don't matter. That's what that statement says. Don't judge me. Let me tell you, the Bible says that judgment begins at the house of God. Judgment begins with the Word of God. And I'm just going to drop a footnote to you here. I'm not your judge. I didn't do anything, amen, to warrant being your judge. I didn't die for you. I didn't rise again for you. My blood won't save you eternally. I might can give you some blood if you want some diabetes. I'll give you some blood. I'll share it with you to keep you alive. But other than that, my blood's no good to you. I can't step in and say, if you do this, I'm going to do this. No. But what people don't like is, because they know their conscience has pricked them. They know that they've went against the teaching of the Word of God. They know that what they've done is against the oracles of God. They'll say, I'm going to do it anyway and just don't say nothing about it to me. I'm already under conviction. I've already been convicted of it. Lest how would you know it's wrong unless you've been taught. Amen? Oh, I'm coming down the road today. Because this is what we've got to understand. When the Bible says, let no man deceive you, it's saying, not even yourself. Don't let your own counsel deceive you. Because we've got this ideal as human beings that all a little bit of something ain't going to hurt us. But the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What does that mean? That a little leaven affects everything. A little sin affects everything. Have you ever seen a woman just a little bit pregnant? You ever seen a drunk just a little bit drunk? Have you ever seen someone abuse somebody that's just a little bit an abuser? There's excess in sin. There's excess in wrong. When wrong gets in, it affects everything. It pollutes and poisons everything. It touches every aspect of your life. 
And when we allow these things to get in us, and I say, oh, it ain't hurting nobody but me. Well, let's do an investigation. Let's do a little exploratory surgery. You want to? Let's cut into this thing. When we get into that place to where we know we're going against God's grain, you know the first thing it affects? Your attitude. Because there comes something that that attitude, that, that nice, pleasant attitude becomes sharp and hateful. Your words become sharp. Your actions toward other people change. That nice person that you used to be that could smile is now that person that's always angry, always irritable, always finding what's wrong in everything. You know? I saw the sky the other day and I just about shouted. You know, we've had clouds for so long. And granted, I get tired of sweating. I mean, you know, the other day I was out there in it, it was so hot it melt butter. I, I mean, you know, Daniel, I mean, it was just hot. 110 degrees in the heat index. I mean, I thought my skin was drooping. It's terrible. And that sun just a beating down. But I didn't ever ask God one time to hide the sun. Why? Because that sun's important. That sun is vital to our survival. And you got to take the good with the bad. You know, you got to take the comfortable with the uncomfortable. When all those clouds come, I can't see the sun. It's dark. It still gets hot and humid. You're still sweating like a fat baby. You know? And I saw that. I saw the clouds break and I saw that blue sky and I want you to know the sky was blue before they ever thought about UNC. Okay? I just need to give y'all deluded UNC fans a little help. They should have made it red. In my opinion. But it's just a reflection of the ocean, right? Just a reflection of God's majesty and God's glory. It's hot. It's sweating. But man, when I saw that clear sky, you know what I knew? Them sunbeams was going to start coming through. And I said, thank God. Well, that's beautiful. I even called somebody on the phone and said, I can see the sky. But when we have these things in our life, it's like our skies are cloudy with thick clouds. And no light can penetrate into our soul. No light can penetrate into our mind. Because we know that there are things in there that ought not to be there. And the Spirit of God's dealing with us. And the Spirit of God's trying to help us. But that inner man in that flesh is saying, no, this is what I want. This is what I want. Any of you familiar with the little shop of horrors? I knew you would be, Tony. If I'm correct, I didn't read the book, but I watched the play. If I'm correct, in the little shop of horrors, there was, it was, revolves around a plant that was dying. That it had no nutrients or no anything, and finally it convinced this young man to give it a drop of blood. And so when it gave that plant the drop of blood, that plant began to come back to life. Now, I ain't never heard of blood-eating plants, but, you know, well, whatever. It's a story. But yet, that one drop of blood didn't satisfy that plant, did it? It just kept on requiring more and more. And didn't it eventually eat the donor? Yeah. Yeah. It became a carnivore. And that plant began to eat people. 
It won't satisfy with insects. It began to eat people. And the plant began to grow because of that lust for more. Hello? Y'all hear me coming? That's exactly what deception does. And that's exactly what sin does. Here, I'll put it where you can understand it real good. That's exactly what indulgence does. When we begin to indulge a little bit of sin in our life, it don't get satisfied. That feeling don't go away. That feeling just don't subside. It comes back, but it comes back with a greater force. And it comes back with a greater push. And it comes back with a greater desire. And it comes back demanding more. More of what? You. Because it wants to consume you. It's not satisfied with that one little spot. It's not satisfied with that one little blemish. It comes back with an ideal that it totally wants to consume you, overtake you, and ultimately kill you. Do you understand the importance of turning your back and forsaking sin? Do you understand the importance of turning your back on deception? Do you understand the importance of doing what is right in God's eyes? Not your eyes, not my eyes, but God's eyes. Just because some man tells you everything all right, don't mean it's going to be all right. We've got to have the assurance of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We've got to have Jesus Christ speaking to our heart, saying, I've washed you, I've covered you, I've delivered you. You're safe and secure from the one that desires to overtake you. But we're so radical in what we want to do, especially today, which is just a product of a culture of past generations, that we're bent, that I'm going to do it this way. Look, we all have to grow, and we all have to learn. But this one right here, this living for Jesus Christ is one we can't afford to get wrong. This is one journey that we can't afford to accept unwise counsel. And so now today, the, dyna the dynamic in the church, the dynamic in the spiritual world is this, is that we just don't have to do it anymore like they used to do it. What is it? They're trying to pull us away from a blood covenant. Listen to me now. I'll make sense to you. They're trying to pull us away from the divinity of Jesus Christ. They're trying to pull us away from the purity of the walk of a child of God. I want you to know that purity counts. How do I know that purity counts? Because Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall. See who? God. Can Jesus lie? He didn't say the impure. And He didn't say the half-hearted. What does that word pure mean? That word pure means that we're without defilement. We're without pollutants. It means that we're absolutely clean. And how are we going to be clean? Except we're cleansed by the flow of Calvary's brow. How are we going to be clean unless we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ the Lord? And let me just go ahead and say it now. That, that doesn't just mean when you got saved that one time. When you went down to the altar and made a confession. This is a walk. This is a daily communion. This is a relationship. Amen. This is going and washing in that wonderful pool of the cleansing power of Jesus Christ the Lord. Day in and day out. Because I get my hands dirty in this world. I get my garments spotted in this world. But I got to go to that fountain that will never run dry. I got to go to that fountain that will never produce dirty water. I got to go to that fountain that will always make me white as snow. Amen. I've got to go back to 
Jesus over and over and over again to make sure, amen, that I'm found worthy in his sight. But folks will tell you today, as long as you made a profession along the way, you'll be all right. No. No, this is a relationship. Brother Jason, if you told Catherine the day you married her, I love you, and you never told her again, and she say, why don't you ever tell me you love me? Well, I told you when I married you, that was enough. Would that work? No, because there's something about that woman. She got to hear it. Hey, I love you. And every once in a while, that man got to say, Brother Earl, now listen, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you I love you. Well, that's what I do. If I don't love you, I ain't going to tell you I love you. I ain't going to lie to you. You tell somebody you love them and you don't love them, you lying. I'm just telling you, you better get, you better know the truth. That's why the preacher stands behind the pulpit and tells somebody you love them only if you mean it. Because I ain't wanting you lying to nobody. But I'll drop a little secret on you. If you can't love your neighbor, you can't love God. I'm, no. I'm going to change that. I don't even like the way that sounded. Let me say it this way. If you don't love your neighbor, you don't love God. I like that a whole lot better. That's more scriptural. But we live with these deceptions. We live with these things in our life that we think are going to be all right. But God warned us about the little foxes, didn't He? God warned us about those little things in our life that's going to cause us great harm because those little ones, they grow up to be big ones and they produce offspring that bring more little ones. And after a while, you're infested with things in your life, amen, that are causing you trouble with Jesus Christ the Lord. And you get to that place to where you feel helpless and you feel hopeless. Well, I can't do nothing about it. I've been doing it this way so long. I don't know how to change. Well, it's all right if you don't know how to change. I know somebody that knows how to change you. I know somebody that has the power to change you. I know somebody that has the power to give you the honesty and the integrity to deal with it and say, Lord, I've had enough of it. And I'll say it this way, when you get tired of sin and when you get tired of sinning and when you get tired of the effects of what it's doing to your life, you'll seek somebody that can take you from it. Amen. And that somebody is Jesus. Ain't no sin going to heaven. Ain't no sin going into heaven. Amen. You might be a sinner, but you ain't going to heaven. Only the born again, only the blood washed are going to the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter to me what the smart people say. Doesn't matter to me what the theologians said. I read the book. And the book tells me that only the blood washed are going to heaven. We've tried to reason it out. We've tried to come to make being a Christian comfortable. I want you to understand being a Christian was never intended to be comfortable. Because being a Christian is warfare. Because we are at war with our flesh, we are at war with the enemy, and we are at war with the world. The Bible tells us in the book of James that he that is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. He that is in love with the devices of the world, that are in love with the pleasures of this world, is an enemy of God. And so if I'm going to be a friend of God, i got to be an enemy of the world. There can be no love, affection, or affinity for the things that the world offers. I'm preaching to you all today. I'm telling you the truth too. Because it's more important for me for you to hear the truth and go to heaven. How do you know it's the truth? Because I got it right out of that book. I didn't get it from a commentary. I got it from a holy script. Sin will kill you, friend. 
Indulgence will kill you, friend. You lying to yourself will kill you, friend. When you're telling yourself you're all right and you're all wrong. And I'm going to go ahead and ride this horse while I'm here. I feel like mounting up on this saddle. And you sit there and say, amen, that we don't need the house of God. You're wrong. You're wrong. You say you can serve God sitting at the house as good as you can going to church. You're wrong. You're lying to yourself. Because I know what's going to happen. You ain't going to pray. You ain't going to seek God. You're not sharing your witness. It's hard to share your witness sitting in your own four walls. You're not going to be faithful. It's hard to talk about somebody being faithful when you ain't faithful yourself. I understand these folks that can't go. I'm not talking about the folks that are not able to go. I'm talking about the able-bodied people that sit on their lazy rear end and won't go to church. And tell me they as good as I am or trying as hard as I am? No. Don't bring that lollipop to me. Because I don't believe it. Because the Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, you want to finish it? You want to finish? As we see the day approaching that we ought to much more Get to God's house. You know what Jesus did when he was on earth? He went to church. The Son of God went to church. The Son of God went to the, oh, I'm sorry, he went to the temple. We'll call this a temple if you want to. Amen. But he went to church. And he expounded upon the scriptures. It's important to go to the house of God. And we deceive ourselves when we're saying it's not. I'm going to tell you, you need the fellowship of like believers. You need the encouragement of like believers. You need that, amen, that comes along in in congregational worship, amen, because it does something to you, amen, that makes it just a tad easier to get to Jesus Because there's an atmosphere that's conducive to worship. Amen. And it's just like we've jumped in a big old bowl together. Amen. And we just praising God. And God's coming right down there with us. It just makes it better for us. Now if you get mad with me, you got to forgive me if you want to go to heaven. But I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to be as honest and as straightforward with you as I know how to be. I'm telling you the house of God is important to you, to your soul, to your life. And I love you enough that if I ruffle your feathers and it will cause you to go to church, then hallelujah. That's right. That's right. We need each other. And we need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need that unity of the faith. Why else do you think that God calls us in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4 to have the unity of faith? Because He wants us to go at this thing together. Look, folks. This is funny to me. I heard a fella, and I watched that video the other day. Billy Locklear, he was singing years ago, and he said, I'm going to sing you a song. You can look it up. He said, Satan done lied to me. He will lie to you. And he will try to convince you. That just being casual in this faith and just giving everything else importance over your walk with Jesus Christ is okay. 
I found my parking spot. I'm fixing to pull in the lights on. That's my Krispy Kreme reference. I want you to understand today that we can't allow self-indulgence to part us from Jesus Christ the Lord. I can't get up in the morning without Him. I can't go to work without Him. Without His grace, without His mercy. And we think about all of these things that are so important to us in life. But I want you to understand today, I can't even live without Jesus saying live. I can't breathe without Jesus saying breathe. My body operates because of the Word of God. My body, your body operates because of the command of God Himself. You can't do it without Jesus. You may be trying, but you're walking in the mercies of the Lord. But there comes a day when that road of mercy runs out. Because He gives you your opportunity to repent and you don't. And He shuts the door. Then life is as good as over. I want you to understand today. Jesus spoke to John and He said, John, you tell him, you don't be deceived. He that does righteously does that which is acceptable to God. But he that sins is of the devil. Do you hear how strongly the Lord looks at our life? Do you see how strongly the Lord gauges our life? I'm going to ask you one more time today. Who are you following? Are you following Jesus? Or are you following your own path? Jesus' way is a straight way and a narrow way. The way of self is a broad way and a destructive way. Which way are you taking today? You know, when this storm was coming, you can stand up. When this storm was coming, I got out and did some things in the yard to alleviate some water problems. But when it was raining hard, I got out there and looked, and I saw I still had a water problem. So I got out there in that storm, that rain pouring down hard. I got Riley out there, and I got Ethan out there too. But I didn't have a choice. It was during the storm, and there was more things to do to try to get that water moving. So I'm out there with a shovel digging. I got Riley up on the house making sure the gutters are clean. I got Ethan out there with the hoe pulling in a trench trying to cut me a little trench for this, that, and the other. Yeah, I didn't want to get wet. But I didn't want to lose my home. Because the water was coming up. You know, the water's already flowing out of the foundation vents. I had to do something. And sure enough, I got out there and made those few little adjustments and a lot of praying. And God made the rain to stop. And God caused the water to abate. And I averted and I avoided the things that I was worried about, I was concerned about. I want to tell you, you in a storm today. And that storm's called life. And there's only one person today that can help shield you from that storm. And that person is Jesus Christ the Lord. What are you doing with your life? Who are you giving your life to? And what are you giving your life to? Are you giving your life to self and the things of this, uh, pleasures of this life that when you get to the end of the way, there's going to be nothing? 
but regret. Nothing but remorse. Or have you turned it over to Jesus? That even though you may have struggles in this life, you know that through the struggle, He's with me. Through the hardships, He's with me. But the best part about it is that when I get to the end of the way, He's going to carry me where I'm not able to go myself. He's going to transfer me from this world to the glory world. And that's only a journey that I can take with Him. What are you doing? Who are you following today? What's your life worth to you? What's your life worth to you? The altars are open this morning if you feel the need to come and pray. If you need Jesus in your life, the altars are open this morning. If you need the Lord to help you with the storms, the altars open this morning.